slowly usually. Um, usually I'll have an idea and sit with it for a couple years maybe, or a year, um, unless there's something that happens that feels like it's a bit more urgent and I feel a lot more committed to it, and then I'll make a, I'll follow it up much quicker. Otherwise, um, once I decide on an idea and um, it gains momentum, I'll start making drawings, I'll start doing some research into, into it. If there's a particular event that's happened, I'll look in, I'll research it, I'll look into different um, images and things that are on social media, um, or I'll look through my archive of drawings and see if there are images that I've been working with that fit that, that idea. And then from that, I'll start putting together different compositions through the drawings and slowly figure out the size of the painting, um, the different elements that I want to contradict the story sometimes, if that's necessary, um, the different histor art historical references that fit. And then ultimately there's the cloth the cloth which will sometimes dictate different parts of the composition. So if there's a particularly textured or wrinkled part of the cloth, it can affect what goes in that particular part of the, the painting. Um, and then, of course, you have colour and um, reference to, to place. Um, and the subject will often push the colour in a particular way or will ask for the painting to be worked on more or less, depending on what it needs. So as, as most of, or almost all of my paintings are based on subjects that are in East Africa, I spend, I spend quite a lot of time out there, mainly, mainly to do drawings. So a lot of the drawings will be from life. They'll be from either people will sit for me or I'll, I'll spend a lot of time traveling around the country um, to particular places that I want to incorporate in the paintings or particular landscapes um, and when I'm there I'll make drawings from life. Then I'll go back to the studio in, in Nairobi um, where again I'll work on maybe more images that are you based on things in social media or popular culture. Um, so like either music videos or um, you know other images you can find on Twitter or you know the, anything that helps really. Um, then I rarely paint, at the moment I rarely paint when I'm in Kenya. Um, it's just more gathering, uh, gathering ideas and um, developing the themes for up and coming shows and new bodies of work. You know, maybe I'll have a couple months out there to prepare stuff for a new body of work and then I'll come back to London and spend my time when I'm in London mainly making the paintings. It's an, it's an interesting setup because you do end up with a lot of distance from the subject, which changes, changes my relationship to what I'm making. And subsequently, so, like, sometimes I'll be kind of energized about a particular aspect of, of the new body of work that when I have a bit of distance doesn't, like, it loses its interest. And other, other elements of the work come, sort of come to the surface and become more important. So then once I'm, once I'm in London, I spend most of my time in the studio just making the paintings. I'll work on several paintings at once. Again, that's, it's just a way of giving me time to digest the marks that I do make, um, the images that I make, and how they all play off each other. So often a decision in one painting will be because of a decision in another as opposed to specifically what that painting needed, which means that the paintings have a, a particular dynamic um, when they are together. And that for me is quite important, how the paintings react off each other and the way that different images influence other paintings. So the, the bark has been, um, and like, it's really opened up the, my painting practice in, in the sense that it's forced, it's forced me to, to change how I paint, to incorporate the surface into the work, which completely destabilizes everything that I did before. Um, it, it's, it's a pretty extraordinary material in that it's, it's made from the, the bark of a, of a lubugo tree. And 
that process is several hundred years old. So the process starts by scraping the skin of the tree off. This is then um, this then exposes what will be the surface of the of the cloth. Um, after that, a shape and machete is used to score down the outside of the bark, only going in sort of a centimetre or two centimetres, so it doesn't damage the inner bark of the tree, which would then kill the tree. So it's very precise. Um, once they do that, they use the, the um, like a, a part of the stalk of a banana leaf tree, of a banana tree, um, to run up the scored line. And this slowly peels away the outer bark from the inner bark of the tree. Um, the reason they use the, the banana leaf and um, is that it doesn't cut into the second bark. This means that the bark keeps, keeps doing what it does and keeps the tree alive, and it doesn't damage it in any way. Um, once they've scored and peeled off the bark, they'll very carefully look for any knots where the bark stuck onto the inner bark, um, and again, slowly prise the bark off, not to damage the tree itself. Then the whole of the bark eventually comes off, and they'll cut it, ring, ring, ring the top of it, so it just comes off the tree. Um, after this, the the guys who who do this wipe their sweat along the whole of the bark um, with a banana leaf, and then they wrap the tree with dry with wet banana leaves, so that it's protected from all the elements. And by the time that the leaves dry off and fall off, the bark would have regrown and it would be strong enough to, to withstand wind, rain, sun, without killing the tree. The bark itself is then taken, um, laid flat on the ground. Dried banana leaves are laid on top of it. They're lit, so it very lightly singes the top of the bark. This then um, changes the colour, so you end up with a two-tone two -tone cloth. On the top, it's a little bit darker, and underneath, it's kind of a paler sienna colour. The bark is then washed and soaked, and all the, um, any of the, the burnt bits of the bark are wiped and rubbed off. After this, this, this means that the bark is a little bit more flexible. So it's then taken to a little shed where the guys will sit and beat it with a mallet that looks a little bit like a meat tenderizer. This goes on for hours. <laughs> it takes probably about five or six hours of beating the bark for it to then soften and become a cloth. The cloth is then laid out in the sun and dried. Um, the drying is over about two weeks. Once that's done, the bark is ready basically. Usually the bark would be used as a burial shroud. Um, so the Bugando, who are the, the main tribe in Uganda, and they're the ones that produce the bark, will bury their dead in the cloth. And they also would use it for major ceremonies. They'll often wear it. I came across the cloth in a, in a tourist store, and it was being used as a placemat. And it was only after looking into the into how I could find this, that I came across this extraordinary process. Um, and that now uh, is the basis for all of the paintings. And in, in my mind, what it does is locate the work very specifically in that part of the world. And not only that, it puts it within a, a longer historical context of cultural production. And th this was incredibly important because ultimately their paintings, and paintings main history, and the one that I look at and draw from the most, is a Western art history. And it was important for me to be able to locate both the history of the work and the, the current cultural references in East Africa.